Uh, God's given us a great word. It's a very challenging word for me. And so I know um, that it's challenging for all of us. But we're actually going to be in a scripture, a chapter, well, book of Luke, chapter 15. A very familiar passage, uh, chapter 15, verses 3 through 7. You probably heard it preached many times. Probably heard it preached more eloquently than I will today. I'm going to tell you, have you ever really paid attention to the context? That's what we want to pay attention to today. What did Jesus really mean? We wrote a lot of good songs about this verse, this passage. But perhaps we've missed the punch, the sting, the bravado that Christ gave this scripture. And he said this parable. It wasn't a soft word that he was giving. So we need to listen to this really, really carefully and pay attention. We'll start out in, in uh, uh, verse 3, Luke 15, verse 3, in God's absolute truth. We're going to go through verse 7. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Pray with me. God, I love you so much. God, what is absolutely most important right now is your word. It always is. There's never a time in our life, God, where your word should reign and rule in our minds, in our thoughts, in our actions, in our members of our bodies, God. We need to follow your word, Lord. I do. I need to obey your word. Holy Spirit, please. I've, I've prayed. I've seen how you, you've put this message together. I just ask you to, to let me bring you honor by being your chosen vessel in this moment. This next few minutes and time that we have together, God, just, just let me be obedient and honor you. Let me just say what you want us to hear. Challenge me. Change me. I, there's not a time, God, you know my heart. I don't ever want to come up here and preach something that I don't desperately need and believe trust and have faith in. And I also don't want to be a person who does a lot of talking but never lives it. I don't want to be a hearer only. God, I, I really desperately want to be a doer. So God, challenge me. Use me. God, Holy Spirit, you're here and thank you. If there's anybody, and you know this, we don't. But Lord, you know this. If there's anybody in this room or listening online right now who does not know you, Jesus Christ, as Savior, Lord, let today, let today be the day of their salvation. Holy Spirit, draw them to Jesus today. Jesus, we know you'll save them. God, for all of us who have placed our lives, our trust, our faith in your hands, who follow you, who are your disciples, Jesus, I know you're going to challenge us this moment. But let us accept and embrace the challenge. And honor you by living through it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we all say Amen. Amen. So, all right, so who's your one? We got this number, this number one that we keep talking about. One, one, right? Sometimes we look at one as a really great thing. Right? There's, there's times in our lives where being number one is really good. Okay? Uh, you know, recent sports debate, who's number one, Michael Jordan or LeBron James. Now they're trying to throw Kobe Bryant in the mix, which I don't even understand that. That's not even a sweet point. I'm just saying. Um, but who's number one? And we've got this, this number one attitude where number one is great. I mean, some people in here, if I were to talk college football, you would shout out a number one team. And it may not be the team that I like, but you would shout that out, right? Um, you know, we, we've got, we got our number ones. And that's number one. Uh, some of you have probably watched the spring day, spring games that have been going on. Uh, a lot of our favorite teams are out there playing the spring games or watching those because they're our number one team. 
Uh, there's, there's other things, like there's athletes that we've watched, you know. I, I think one of the best players, and this might make my uh, rivalry uh, fans who don't like my team happy, but I think Bo Jackson is one of the best players that's ever touched any ball. I mean, he's just an amazing athlete. Uh, if it wasn't for his injuries, who knows what he'd end up doing in the NFL. My goodness, he's great. Uh, that's Bo Jackson. But he's, he's one of the greatest all-time players. There's no question. Dual athlete. So we got all these number ones. And sometimes we look at number one as being the greatest. I hope that you come to church and say, I got the number one church. Amen. If you don't believe that, then you need to probably go somewhere else, to be honest with you. And I, I've had people come up to me all the time. And it's interesting because I'm as a pastor of a church, right? So it's neat when people invite me to church. And they you really need to come to our church. We have the best, the greatest church. And I'm like, that's great to hear, but that's a little problem with being attending your church. Right? I'm actually a pastor of my church. So I can't just, just go over to your church. Oh, really? I said, but you know what? I love hearing that because if you didn't believe that, you probably should leave that church. Amen. And so, we, you know, we, we have a lot of number ones. But sometimes number one can also be seen as the least. Right? Sometimes we see number one as great. But sometimes we see number one as, well, it's not two or three or four or a hundred. I got tickled. Uh, we, we just recently had a yard sale trying to make a little extra cash. You know how that is. You want to try to make a little extra cash, clean out your house. So we had this short sale, and the Lord bless us, we did pretty well. And uh, so we're sitting down, and Audrey's next to me, and she sold some of her toys. And I think, I don't know, she made like 20 something dollars, I think it was, uh, off her little stuff, which I couldn't believe it, because she would, I'm like selling things for 50 cents, Audrey's like $6. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then it works, because then she walks up to him like, that's mine, you know, what are they going to do? Give her six cents. Like give and so she's like $23 off this little, little stuff that she sold. Well, then we're sitting down, and Audrey looks at me. She gets her $23, and she looks at me, and she goes, I thought we were each getting $100. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. But a lot of times, that's what we're like. You know, we, we're very ungrateful sometimes. We get, a, we get a dollar, but we really want $10 or $20, you know. And so we're like, a dollar is something you didn't have before. You should be thankful for that. Because there's times we look at that number one, we look at it and we diminish that one. Well, can I tell you that our Lord and Savior cares about the one? Amen. Our Lord and Savior cares about the one. You know, too many times we're like, well, I only have one this, one that, one. But I see in Scripture where my, my God cares about the one Amen. all throughout the text. And I'm so thankful for that. That he values the one. I'm thankful that I'm one that he valued. Amen. Amen? Aren't you? Amen. He valued you. You're that one he valued. Um, as followers of Christ, sometimes we often overlook the value of one. One invitation to church. One neighbor to go talk to. One co-worker to go share the gospel with. One classmate to go, go love on in the name of Christ. One family member who desperately needs Jesus. One friend that we can be there for. One enemy that we can be there for to share the love of Christ. A lot of times we overlook the one, don't we? And let me ask you this. This is the question as we move forward. In your mind, right now, not out loud, but in your mind, name one person who has accepted Christ because you shared the gospel with them. In your mind, name one person who's accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord because of you. Because you played a part in that life of sowing a seed or watering a seed or being there when the seed grew, right? Into salvation. What about that one person that you invited to church that time? And then you watched and go down the aisle and receive Christ. And you watch them get just passionately enraptured with His Word, right? And you watch them, and you look now, and it's been years, and now they're teaching Sunday school class, or, or they're a deacon, or, or, they're, or they're a nursery worker, and you just see them, they're in love with Jesus. Why? Because there were one life that God used you to reach. Think about that. Our Lord cares about the one. Jesus says there cares about the one. I want to look at verse 4. 
I want you to see this verse 4 again. It says, Jesus told him this parable, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? You see, there we see Christ cares about the one. Amen? But let me tell you, to understand this parable, we cannot divorce it or pull it out of its context. That's dangerous. And we lose the impact of the message. Let's go back to verse 1 and 2 and see what was going on. Verse 1 says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to Him, to hear Him. Who is Him? Jesus. So all these lost people, these sinners, were drawing near to Christ so they could hear Him, hear His words, hear His teachings. And in verse 2, And the Pharisees and the scribes, by the way, these are all these religious people, who thought they had the, the, the market cornered on knowing God. Right? Here they are. The Pharisees and the scribes, they began grumbling, it says. They grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. That's the context before Jesus gives this parable. Here he is. Remember what we, told, we talked about? He's engaging the lost people. Is he not? He's engaging them. He is being very intentional about sharing his love with them, sharing the gospel with them. So why? So that they might come to Christ and be saved. Amen? That's what he's doing. Okay? That's exactly what Christ is doing. And then these people, all high and mighty, we'll just call them in our day, churchgoers. And all these churchgoers are like, look at that Jesus. He's over there meeting and eating with sinners. Tax collectors, nothing worse than tax collectors in their day. Now, we don't like tax collectors, are they? Do we do much, unfortunately? You know, if you're if you're if you're in the business, I'm sorry, but that's just kind of you know we're, we were doing our taxes. We, many of us have done our taxes, and if you haven't done your taxes, Monday, which is me, <laughs> procrastination. So that's the context. These were religious people who were criticizing Christ for engaging sinners. And this is the response. All right, keep it framework. Framework it. They're criticizing Christ for engaging the lost people. And this is what Christ says. He says this. I'm going to read it to you one more time. What man of you? You hear it? What man of you having a hundred sheep if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. Here's what he says. We look at this passage, and I'm not negating that Christ's love is not extraordinary. But here's what Jesus is saying to these people. He said, what person, wouldn't any of you do the same thing? This is what he's saying. He's saying, would you not, any man of you, if you had a hundred sheep and one straight away, would you not leave the flock in the open country, strength in numbers, to go walk out and find the one that's straight away? And you would do anything you could to find the one that's straight away. Wouldn't you do that? You see the picture? See, we look at it and we immediately go to Christ's extraordinary love. But that's not the point he's trying to make right now. He's trying to tell you this is ordinary love. What person like you wouldn't do this? You see it? Amen. That's what he's saying. He's saying that. It's amazing. It's re, it's, it's a re, it wasn't a remarkable act. Listen. It wasn't a remarkable act for a shepherd to leave his 99 safe in the open country and go after the one that was lost. That was ordinary love. That's what any good shepherd would do. You see my point? Any good shepherd would have done that. They would have went and found the one. And we look at this passage and we immediately want to go, wow, what a remarkable, amazing act of love. But that's not the initial point Christ is giving. That's not what he's giving here. His point was that any shepherd would have done the same for their sheep. This is why he says to the Pharisees, he describes what man of you when you do this. 
Here Christ looks at these who are grumbling about him, engaging the lost, and says, You men, wouldn't you do the same? Any decent shepherd would. What Jesus is actually saying is that you people care more about one animal. Hold up. You people care more about one animal than you do one human. Human. He says, look, any shepherd would go get that sheep. What man of you wouldn't do the same? What man of you wouldn't do the same? And in common sense, they're thinking through this and going, yeah, you're right. And what person wouldn't go look for that one lost animal? But Jesus is flipping the picture from an animal to a human. You would do it for an animal, but you won't do it for a human life. Look at this picture. Do I hear it? I don't hear it yet? Oh, I know. See, see I knew we were going to get that all. Oh. That's an animal. It's a cute little puppy. It's behind a fence. It's in. It's 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 imprisoned behind this little fence. You know. Uh, it's 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 needing rescuing, right? This cute, adorable animal needs to be rescued. What person among us? Some of you probably would, because some of you may just be animal like haters. I don't know. If you are, I got a man named Jesus. You can meet. Um, but but. Most of us would immediately see this picture of this puppy and what we'd want to do. We want to run in that little, that little pound and we want to scoop up that little puppy and we want to take that little puppy home and feed it and love it and talk like history at your feet. You know we would. A little puppy. Look at his eyes. They like water and stuff. What person among you would run off and go help this poor puppy, this animal. <laughs> and like, Not me. Can I tell you, that's common love, though. Most people would. That's common. Most people would see a puppy like that in a cage like that and just their heart sink for that little puppy. Why, why? I know that. I mean, you look at the commercials. Look at the, Look how many people give more money to save Dolphins and whales and puppies and cats and meerkats, I guess. I mean, they find anything to say. We're saving worms next year. I don't know. We're saving animals. So much money given to animals. It's not extraordinary love, is it? This is ordinary love. This is what a lot of people do. Look at this next picture. That's a human being. That's a real life. Who's behind bars? Who desperately needs Jesus Christ? But just in this very moment, there's a knee-jerk emotion that you just had. Don't lie. You just had a knee-jerk emotion. You didn't balk for a second at scooping up the puppy. But when you saw him, there was a knee-jerk reaction there, wasn't it? There's a little hesitation that you felt. You're not so quick. We're not so quick, are we, to run and go rescue him? Like that puppy, right? Amen. We're not so quick to want to go scoop up or go scoop up the puppy. We're not so quick to go scoop up him. We'll say things like, well, he deserved it. He did things that put him there. He, he, he said these things. He's committed these crimes. He's done these things. And he deserves behind bars. And he needs to stay there locked up for the rest of his life. We don't say that about the puppy. We don't say that about the puppy. But there's a life staring back at you and me that means Jesus Christ. They need salvation. They need to be saved. They need to be set free. That was me. That was you. If you're saved, that was you. Amen? Lost behind a prison of sin in our lives. If it wasn't for someone having an extraordinary love for us and going and telling us about Christ, we'd still be behind the bars. This takes extraordinary love. That's the contrast and comparison. Jesus looks at these religious leaders and said, what man of you wouldn't go after that sheep? But here I am reaching the lost who desperately need me. And you are balking at it. You are, you are scoffing at it. 
look at you. You care more about a sheep than you do about these people. These tax collectors. These sinners. These prostitutes. These low downcast people. You don't care about them. You won't associate with them. But boy, you'd do anything you could to find that animal. You see, that's the love Christ does show for us. Yes, Christ shows extraordinary love. Because He came to set us free. He came to save us. He cares about our soul. Amen? Amen. Our eternity. It takes extraordinary love. We should care about the one like Christ cares about the one. Shouldn't we? Amen. He cares about the one. We should. Jesus was engaging the lost. Jesus was engaging the sinners because he cared about them. And we should care about that one as well. We should. Those who are lost, those who are sinners, those who are without Christ, we should desperately care about. Jesus didn't look. Now listen, Jesus didn't look at the 99. If we look at this, this, this parable, Jesus could go, hey, well, look, what man are you? Let me just say it this way. Jesus could say, what man are you? Looks and has one sheep straight away and go, wow, I got 99, I'm all still okay. Hear it? What man of you would say, hey, you know, it's only one sheep gone. It's just one, right? Just one. I still have 99. Better stay with my 99 because I, I, I just lost one. Is that Jesus' heart? No. Why is it ours? Why is that our heart? Why somehow, some, some way we're okay in our churches when we look out and go, well, we have, I don't know, today, I don't know, we might have, what, maybe 180, I don't know, people in the building. And go, wow, got 180. A year ago we had 275, but that's okay, we still got 180. That's fine. What's wrong with that picture? Why aren't we going out? In the hedges, in the highways. Why aren't we seeking people? Do you do you and I think that there's not a lot of lost people in our in Munford? Is there a lot of lost people in Munford? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do they need Jesus? Yeah. So why are we sitting here going, we've got enough? We're okay. Why aren't we consumed with the lost people. Because the reality is, we might in, be in the car today, driving home, and see a stray dog, and jump out of the car and scoop it up. But we'll see a stray human being and Jesus and drive as fast as we can past Am I wrong? Sad. Jesus didn't look at the 99 and say, well, I lost one, I'll just keep I'm just, I'm okay, I have no that, but that's what we do. Well, there are many guesstimates out there, okay? Many ideas out there. Let me just say, it's safe to say that there's at least a million people, guess where? In the state of Alabama, who are unchurched. Guys, did you hear that? That's a safe estimate. There's about a million people in our state that don't go to church anywhere. A lot of lost people in Alabama. Amen? So we can't get in our holy huddles on Sunday and go, we're okay. We have a few hundred people. We're okay. When there's a million people out there lost who need Jesus. Amen. But Jesus cares about the one. Can I tell you, when you walk out of the building today, there's going to be a one that you come encounter with today. And let me tell you, when you look into their eyes, Jesus deeply, desperately cares for them. And we should too. Could it be that even though this harvest field is so huge, even in Alabama, could it be that we've become just like these Pharisees and scribes? We have no problem reaching out to an animal, but... When it comes to some people, we begin to judge them and criticize them and justify ourselves for not going to them. Now hear that. That's what we're good at. 
We're good at justifying things in our lives. Good. I, I am. I'm, you, I'm good at justifying things that I do. Sin that I've done in my life. I'm very good at justifying. Anybody else? Good at justifying things? Yeah. We're good at justifying. And we will justify our ways right out of sharing the love of Christ with people. We say all oh, manner of reasons why we don't share the love of Christ with people or the gospel. We make all sorts of excuses. They don't dress like us. They don't look like us. They don't like what we like. They don't love, live like we do. They're rough around the edges. They, they use certain words I don't use. They drink things that I would not drink. They smoke things I would never smoke. They shoot up things I would never shoot. They sniff things that I would never sniff. Glue. And they sell stuff that, that they shouldn't. That's just wrong. It's just it's illegal. I wouldn't do it. They're rowdy. They're rambunctious. They're unkept. They're unclean. They're not cool enough. They're not this. They're not that. They're dirty. They're just not like me. There's a lot of people out there not like me. And if you've been around me long enough, that's a good thing. That's a real good thing. This world couldn't stand much more of one of me. A lot of people are, that's one of the beautiful things about, about what God has created. He's handcrafted everybody. He's knitted everybody together in their mother's womb. This is the creator God. And so we look out at the world, and it's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, if everybody looked like you, would it be interesting? No. Some of you would be a horror movie. I was a joke. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just no, God has given us beautiful diversity. <clears throat> and I want to say this. Aren't we in this room who are saved glad that Jesus didn't mind getting a little dirt on his hands? To reach the lost. Guys, when you're around the lost, guess what? They don't know Christ. They didn't grow up like you did. They, there's people that you'll encounter. They didn't grow up in a Christian home. They don't know what it means to, to sit down and have prayer together as a family or to sit down and have a, a blessing at a meal. They don't have a clue. They don't, they don't understand or even get or fathom why the language they use out of their mouth would be unholy and, and unwholesome to use. They don't get that. They're lost. So when you're around lost people, get what lost people do. What lost people do. But when you know what we do, we won't even get past that barrier because we begin judging them immediately. Well, I don't want to be around that person. All they do is use the F-bomb. Well, how do you reach them? And let me tell you, you're not going to reach me by going, hey, look, I'm going to tell you right now. You use that kind of language like me, I'm not talking to you no more. You think you're going to reach them like that? They don't, care. they don't care about you or your God. They don't. But you know what they will start caring about? The fact that you begin loving them or interested and you care about them. That's going to start saying, well, wait a second, what's going on here? What's going on here? Why, why in the world do you care about me? Why are you taking an interest in me? Because Jesus loves you. To leave the 99 and to go find the one means that you will get some dirt on your clothes. Amen? The righteous robe that you are clothed in, in the name of Jesus, you're going to get a little dirt on it when you go reach the lost. Amen? You've got to be willing to go through those barriers. And it's going to get harder as the days go on on this earth. We need to be willing to reach the lost. Just like this shepherd who went to find the one lost sheep, we are called to go and find the lost and carry them to Christ. Your picture here is that this shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes after the one and he will not stop. Did you see it? He won't stop until he what? Finds it. He doesn't quit. He doesn't give in. There's no quit in him. He's going to keep going until he finds that one. And to find that one is not going to be easy. It's going to take a lot of hard work. He's going to get dirty. He's going to search in multiple locations. Maybe come back to multiple locations. But he's going to track that sheep down. But when he finds that sheep, there's great rejoicing. 
That's where I want to finish on this point. The last point here is we should rejoice over the one. Christ rejoices over the one, shouldn't we? Look at verse 5. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now keep in mind, we understand Jesus is a good shepherd. We understand that when we look at this, we can see a picture of Christ leaving the, the sheepfold of heaven to come down and find the ones that are lost. Amen? If you're saved, He found you and He put a Jew on His shoulders, there was great rejoicing. And He's carrying you where? Back to the sheepfold, which is heaven. Amen? And there's great rejoicing in salvation when one person comes to Christ. Excuse me. When one person receives Jesus as Savior Lord, this brings Christ abundant, exceedingly great joy. He rejoices. And it should bring us the same joy, shouldn't it? And that's, I'm telling you, we should be enraptured and live for that. And those moments. We've seen people say, it was a couple of weeks ago, we had a couple of two, two children saved in here. Praise God. Amen. And that's amazing. I'm going to tell you, there's churches in America. I, I've talked to pastors who, I'm telling you, for years have not seen one person saved in years. I'm not saying this is the fall of pastors. These are men of God who are pouring out their hearts. But I'm telling you, I mean, they're so hungry. And, they're, and it's like, it's like the, the, the cabinets are so dusty just to see one person saved. But in some churches, and over the last four years, we've seen many people saved at the church. Praise God. But in some churches, it becomes old hat. Yep. Another saved. Yep. Yep, that's good. Yep, mm, that's great. No, I'm saying, yeah. Not true, abundant, exceeding joy. True rejoicing. I'm just going to tell you. And it, it really should be. We, you know, and I hate to say it this way, but I don't know how to say it. We should probably scare the death out of that person that got saved by our jumping up, standing up, interrupting, and praise. No. I'm just serious. I remember when my son, I told this story yesterday, my son, my oldest son, Austin, he's playing baseball. It was, I don't remember what game it was, but it was, it, he had struck out every time at this one time. And as a daddy, all I wanted to see him was get a hit. Was get a hit, son. So he gets a hit. Well, you know what me and mama and everybody else in the stands do when he finally gets a hit? Scream. We are screaming. We are so excited. Run, son, run. Run, son, run. Ooh, run. Run. He's like, you know, he's about this tall, you know what I'm saying? And he don't know what to do. And he comes off, he finally gets around the bases and he comes in. He's got tears streaming down his face. I don't know what are you crying for, son. Is everybody yelling at me, daddy? I didn't understand it. He never wanted to play baseball. Again. But let me tell you this. That's how it should be when someone receives Christ here. We should cheer and say, run, run, son, run, run for Jesus, run. You're his now. Get out there and run. And you know where you're running, son? You're running home. Run. We don't do that anymore. By and large, churches don't do that anymore. So Jesus says when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. What a, a slap in the face of these, these religious leaders. He said, you don't even get it. You'd run after this animal. And you'd be all excited about a sheep coming back to the sheepfold. But here I am trying to reach these lost people. Who desperately need my Father in heaven. And the only way they can know my Father is through me. Jesus Christ is the way he's saying. That's it. And you don't rejoice. You don't care. You condemn. You judge. You care more about that animal than you do this human life. I'm going to tell you.
tell you, the whole host of heaven is going to be praising when that one human life comes see Christ. I like to give angels a run for their money. What about y'all? What about y'all? I like giving one for the money, man. You want to you want to rejoice? You want to out rejoice me? Let's see how that works out for you, angel. Let's go. Someone get saved. Someone get saved today. I want to see an eruption in this building. I've been praying for salvation for two weeks in this building today. Because I honestly believe there's people who's ready to need Jesus Christ every morning. I really do. And I, I do expect an eruption. Let me finish this with this verse. Y'all please stand. But verse 10 told us, just so I tell you, there is joy for the angels of God over one sinner repents. A whole host of heaven is, is, is throwing, it will, it will throw a rejoicing party when a lost person comes to Christ. Someone who is lost now been found in Christ. And we should rejoice. Rejoice. And again I say, rejoice. Rejoice. I have, and I close with this, I have been in church services as a pastor, seen people saved. Look out. See, here's the, here's the crazy part. I get a perspective y'all don't get to see. Sometimes I, I wish I could be a fly on wall sometimes and just see what I get to see from this thing. I get to see a lot of sometimes really interesting things. Sometimes pretty funny things. Some of y'all... You know, when you're up real late at nights and you get to church, I get to watch you doze off. <laughs> Y'all, let me just tell you, I'm 80 triple HD, and that sometimes gets really difficult for me to stay on track. But I watch you go, <laughs> you know, and I see things. Here's one of the things I've seen in the past. Someone receives Christ. I see people who clap, but then I see some people who are just like. Now, if you're lost and that's why you're doing it, I get it. I understand that. But I don't get it if you're saved. Amen. If you're a Christian, I don't understand it at all. We should rejoice. Guys, Jesus cares about the one. Amen. Amen. We have to care about the one, too. When we leave out of here today, there's going to be a one out there. And we have to look that person in the eye and care about See them the way Christ sees them. Care about them the way Christ cares about them. And be willing to be like the shepherd, to go find the one. Be willing to keep going until they are what? Found. Saved. And when they're saved, don't let an angel out rejoice you. Don't do it. Give God great rejoicing. Amen. Praise Him. Uh, just going to finish and pray. But honestly, Alabama or Auburn should never get our praise the way Christ gets. Should get it. Amen. Amen. These teams of ours should never get our praise. We will shout. We act stupid. We will spit. We will break TVs. We will throw nachos across the room. Yep, hold on, right? We should praise God better than all of that when a lost person comes in. Because that really matters. I'm a Miami Hurricane fan. I can't even, I hardly can remember half of We don't have very many championships, so I can't remember much about them, but it doesn't matter. I didn't lose sleep in Alabama lost last year. My life went on. I didn't have any skin in the game. Y'all know that? I wasn't on the field. I didn't have any bruises or scrapes or, scr or cuts. I didn't lose a thing. Guys, there are people whose life will go on for eternity, either in heaven or hell. Jesus cares about the one. We should do. Father, I love you so much. I praise you. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for absolute truth. Your word is so sweet and so beautiful. God, I know that in a room this size, I know, and I know there's people listening online, I know for a fact, God, that there are people who could be in this room that have never accepted you, Jesus Christ, as their Savior and Lord. And Holy Spirit, right now, there's something going on in their spirit, in their soul. They, they are feeling a tugging going on. They feel they need to come down and pray. But maybe for whatever reason, 
They're nervous or scared. I've been there, God. I know that feeling. And I also know that is not of you. Because your love and your mercy and your grace and your forgiving. And you stand with arms open wide that if we would just step out of where we are and come down to you, you will wrap us up in your love, mercy, and forgiveness and your grace. Holy Spirit, I pray you lead people down to receive Jesus Christ the same word today. With all my heart, let they be saved. Let them just cry out and seek forgiveness for their sins. Let them embrace you, your salvation today. And let us say, get up and run, son, run. You're headed home to heaven. Have your way in this moment. I love you. I praise your name, Jesus Christ.